the reason I was able to achieve success was really because I only had to take care of myself. I knew that I hated finance. I hated accounting when I was in school. I hated like that kind of stuff. And funny enough, I look at spreadsheets a lot. <laughs> like all great stories, it's always by accident. Um, I see a lot of marketers, they really focus on front end, right? Like we get the client in. I see very little effort on the upsells, a lot less than what's on the front end. Some people that go crazy with the upsells and then there's some people who do nothing with the upsells and I always see that there's those two extremes so I would say the number one thing is take as much effort as you you take on your front end funnel do that for your upsell funnel trust me it's gonna work you're gonna make a lot more money you're gonna you know get more lifetime value off your clients and it's not gonna be a, a lot of effort in terms of Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here in Streamline to Scale. We have the incredible Maria Sparagas here talking to us today about merchanting services. And she has one heck of an amazing background, uh, story, everything else that I can't wait to share with you, her knowledge and just expertise in this area. So thank you for being here, Maria. Super excited to have you. Very excited to have our chat. Thank you for having me, Michelle. This is, this is going to be fun. So just, just so you guys have like a little background on Maria here. So first I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you her bio and everything. Um, but I want you to know, like first the way that I met Maria, this is like an exceptionally cool experience for me because Maria is the first person who's ever interviewed me for a podcast. And I was just like, Oh my gosh, stars. Like this is so cool. <laughs> But even cooler than that is the whole reason that I met Maria is I met her through one of the masterminds that we were in. Uh, we met at like a virtual event of Copy Accelerator in like 2020 and COVID stuff. And then um, one of the team members at Copy Accelerator was like, you know, you really should follow Maria and how she leads business as a businesswoman and just how she takes care of things, how she takes care of clients, how she how she speaks and just kind of everything that Maria does is incredible. And you'll you'll get to see a lot of her knowledge here and her expertise and how she approaches business. And it's just really an inspiration. And so he suggested I follow her for that. Uh, and it's just she's been one of my inspirations and a guiding light in uh, in my business, especially over the last few years. So I'm really grateful to have Maria here. Um, and just so you all know, Maria is the founder of Direct Payment, a payment services firm that specializes in international and U.S. domestic merchant accounts, mainly for high-risk merchants. So a lot of people in DR are working with her, um, especially, you know, the higher accounts doing over 25 a month. Um, she, she's really, she hosts a weekly podcast on unsen called uncensored direct marketing, which is where she had me so cool. It's, I mean, she's got amazing speakers on there and she's a fantastic host herself. Um, and they discuss a lot of topics, you know, related to running an online direct business, such as media buying, copywriting, funnel hacking, and conversion tactics. Uh, we also talked about hiring and some other stuff on there. So it's pretty cool. Um, in addition, Maria selectively works as a consultant to clients on an international scale to aid in creating a payment processing strategy as help with secondary revenue sources and optimizing the checkout process. So she's really just fantastic all around person to be consulting with and really optimizing your funnels and your offers. Um, but prior to direct paynet, Maria was the VP of monetization at uh, Man Mansef. I'm going to butcher this one. Mansef Parent Company. It's a parent company of Pornhub, guys. This is this is this is the thing. Like Maria has been in the in the trenches. She's been there. She knows what she's doing. Uh, and several other of the world's largest adult entertainment sites. So, I mean, talk about, you know, difficult getting good merchant processing and avoiding high fees and being closed down and all these things that we often face, especially in direct response or when you're doing high numbers, Maria has all that experience. So in when she was working with them, she had a department that handled payment services for all properties, as well as secondary revenue sources for all major brands. Um, she's a speaker of English, French, and Greek fluently. Uh, she always has the best Greek recipes, by the way. And she has degrees from both Concordia University, John's Molson School of Business, as well as project management from McGill University. So Maria's just been one heck of a businesswoman her entire life. She's incredible and inspiration and somebody I'm super grateful to have here. So 
again, thank you for being here, Maria. I appreciate you. Well, that was a really good intro. I, I was like, who is she talking about? That's impressive. That's not bad. <laughs> it sounds more impressive when other people say it. So thank you for that wonderful intro. Well, you were an incredibly impressive woman. So yeah, I'm grateful to have you in my circle and super excited to have you here today. So um, yeah, I would, I would love to hear a little bit more. I mean, can you tell all of us a little bit more about your journey and, and how it led to the merchant processing? Sure. So, <clears throat> I mean, it, it, like all great stories, it's always by accident. I didn't like grow up and say, Hey, one day I'm going to be selling merchant accounts or I'm going to be a payments expert. I actually didn't even know this field existed. I didn't know anything about it. I knew that I hated finance. I hated accounting when I was in school. I hated like that kind of stuff. And funny enough, I look at spreadsheets a lot. Uh, and I'm actually pretty good at like finance stuff. Um, so that's why I guess I'm, I'm, I'm good at my job, but just to kind of give you a quick, uh, quick kind of start of the career. So, I mean, I went to school, did a couple of degrees, uh, because that's what you're supposed to do, right? Um, you're supposed to do that because supposed to give you some enlightenment, enlightenment of like, what's going to happen. So I finished school and I was like, I have no idea. Like, like I studied in business and like very kind of random things that were just not specialized. It's like, it's one thing when you go to school and you're a doctor or you're an accountant or you're a lawyer, I just kind of went into business school. So it was like, okay, so now I'm done my degree. And then I was like, oh, you know, I should do something else. Maybe I should be a project manager. Cause that sounds like it's cool. Um, and, and I did that. Um, and project management is cool, but like, you got to be specialized in something before you could start managing projects for that said thing. So it was like, I couldn't find a job. They're like, well, you don't know anything. What are you going to manage? And I was like, I don't know. I thought I can manage something. <laughs> you know? So it, it, was, it was, it was just like, that's what happens. I find to a lot of kids in school when you go into these like random uh, topics that don't have a specific job, it's like, okay, well, what do I do now? Um, anyway, it was, it was an interesting journey. I think the project management was cool because it kind of made me be pretty organized, like in my, in my brain, like how to position stuff, which is helpful. Uh, but yeah, when I finished school, I just decided to go into like tech and I worked at uh, a couple of companies kind of doing, uh, I was a, a DBA, uh, database manager for a while. Uh, I did a lot of stuff in customer service. Actually, I was a customer service manager for like four years uh, for a big call center. Um, so it actually, the reason I'm saying that specifically, because I thought it was kind of a useless part of my life in terms of like experience. But I have to say with the clients that I work in, work with now, it's always helpful to know about like customer service and how to manage, you know, chargebacks, disputes, refunds and all that. It all kind of comes into play. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, I did that for a couple of years, was bored out of my mind. Um, and was just like, I what am I doing? Like, I don't like this. Um, and because I'm very, a lot older than you and most people probably listening, I wouldn't say I'm very old. I'm just older than a lot of people, uh, in, in this niche. Um, the internet was starting to be a big thing. So I guess you, you, you started to understand that the era of what I'm talking about, like early two thousands. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I was always, sorry. The AOL, the yes, dial yes, the AOL dial-up and so forth. So I had that obviously as a teen. I was always fascinated with computers. Uh, you know, in in 1995, Windows 95. I was like, I gotta wait in line. I gotta get Windows 95. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the hell an operating system is, but I need it and I want it. Um, so I like begged my parents. I worked part time jobs. I did everything that I could. Um, and then there was like free internet stuff that you can find uh if some people were online back in the day when net zero was around it was uh it was a really funny thing it was like you download a browser it was called net zero they'd give you free internet so long as they can advertise for you uh, or they could advertise to you so half your screen was advertising on like a little like 13 inch screen and the other half was where you could actually navigate and 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 get stuff done it was hilarious it was slow as shit but i was so amazed by that i said i have to work in tech i have to work online i have to be in the internet and so forth uh and a couple of friends of mine were also in that kind of same mindset um and they started doing some affiliate stuff it was like oh what's an affiliate how does that work affiliate marketing really at the infancy of it um there was like networks like commission junction and all these kind of like very old big uh networks that were trying to get people to promote amazon and so forth the beginning of it um and they started focusing on being adult content affiliates so it was just you know 
they were kids, it was like, oh, let's make some money. And this is paying really, really well. So they started making a couple of bucks and so forth. And then the couple of bucks became thousands and then tens of thousands. And it started really getting really big. So they wanted to organize themselves a little bit and try to kind of make this a thing and, and make it a company. And what better way to legitimize an adult entertainment company than by getting a woman to help you? Uh, so it was a, just a bunch of guys and they were like young and, and they were trying to hire and like everybody would like hang up in their face and like nobody wanted to work with them. I was like, I don't, I don't want to work in an adult company. So they were my friends. They came to me and said, Hey, do you want to work with us? I'm like, yeah, I'm not working for a porn company. Like, no, thanks. Like, that's like, no, like, no, I'm too young for this It's going to stain my CV, my resume. This is not going to be good. Uh, and then, you know, it took a little bit of massaging and like, Hey, come on, just come. Like, we need you. We need somebody there. And I was like, all right. You know, I, I, I was always kind of the type of person that was like, you know, what's the worst that can happen if I go there and I don't like it, I'll just get another job. You know what I mean? I was never really that worried and still not that worried about like my next, my next dollar call it or whatever. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to join in. If it doesn't work out, I'll give, I'll give it like three months. If I'm really like, I can't do this, I'm gonna leave. Uh, day one walked in, sat down, started. I'm like, I got up. I'm like, it's not for me. I got to get out of here. <laughs> and I literally, I was like, I got to get out of here. It was like, it's like porn all over screens, these guys oh, all around. I was like young little girl. I was like, what, what am I watching? What is this? I don't want to see those. Like, ew, 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 like, ew, ew. I was like, no, no, no. You know, and, and like, and they had like little niches of things that were kind of like weird. And like, I'm like, no, no, no. Like I thought it was more like regular porn, not weirdo porn. Um, but they had different stuff for, for, for different audiences. And I was freaked out about it. My friend came to talk to me. He's like, okay, it's not for you because they had put me into affiliate sales and I was like, I can't do this. I had to watch the content. I had to create ads. I'm like, I can't do this. It's not for me, not for me. So they're like, oh, why don't you help us with HR? And I'm like, great, but I don't know anything about HR because I've never actually hired anybody. I don't know what you're talking about. They're like, yeah, yeah. Just call a couple of people, look at their CVs, you know, about tech, you can help us. And I'm like, all right, I'll be an HR manager. <laughs> so I was, I became the HR manager. <laughs> You can uh, literally experience in every single aspect of online business. <laughs> well, you got you got you got to be open to things. I was like, well, again, well, I'm going to try it. If I really suck at it, I'll do something else. I, I was actually pretty good at it. I hired the first 90 people who worked there, who became like VPs and and directors because I knew a lot about tech. You know, I had kind of gone through that. Um, and then once I did that, and I was kind of used to the kind of that for about a year and a half at the company, uh, I got their payroll set up, I got their insurance plan set up, I was just researching and just figured it out somehow. Um, and then when we got to about 90 people, HR started becoming an intense kind of thing where I had to manage and, and I was like, it's just not my thing. As you know, Michelle, you came to work with me because HR is not my thing. I'm not crazy about it. And I just, I like when it's kind of done and I have the team there and I can manage them at that point. Um, so I moved on to, I wanted to find myself another project. And the only way that they would let me get out of HR is if I found something else, because they liked me there. They liked me and HR was doing a good job. So I uh, was looking through all the different business processes and seeing how we can make money. And I was like, wait a second, why is, why is this company taking 15% of our money? Like, what is that? I started looking and I was like, huh? So we had a payment processor that was work that was basically processing payments for us. And they were charging 14.95% plus, plus keeping 10% in a reserve fund. So before we saw a dollar, 25% was gone. Oh. And I was like, we had good margins, but hey, wouldn't it be great if you had bigger margins than, you know, uh, that? Um, and we were in Canada getting paid in US dollars. The exchange rate is always in our favor. So it was kind of like, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But then I was like, hey, went up to the, the we called him Big Boss, went up to Big Boss, said, hey, uh, can I uh, can I take a look at this and see if I can find some money here that we can save? He's like, yeah, right. I'm like, so can I quit HR and do this? He's like, find somebody else for HR and then you can do whatever you want. I was like, great. Uh, so I actually did find somebody else, my sister, and she came and took over HR. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I, I started focusing on that project. Uh, I thought it was just going to be like a month or something. And it ended up I started really like researching because I love research. I like researching and reading about stuff. And I was going through all these like rabbit holes. I took the costs from like 15% down to four. 
Wow. So it was like 11%. Yes, this is millions of dollars. This is insane amount of money. Um, And I was starting to work on foreign exchange because we were making pounds with certain, like in the UK. So, okay, let's convert it to to Canadian when it's opportunistic for us. And, And it just became such a big project. I ended up having a team of eight people. It was like mm-hmm. nobody was doing anything about it before. And then a team of eight people, merchant accounts, different corps, different setups, crazy, crazy amount. And then uh, in 2010, early 2010, uh, they sold the company, like my friends that had started it. They sold the company to like a bigger group, uh, corporate group. And I decided I wanted to exit because I was not feeling being in like a big company corporate vibe. Uh, I was like, oh, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm done with this whole like, I, I never wanted to work for large companies. Like I'm just not like a big corporate America kind of person. I like lean, mean kind of uh, setups. So I I quit. Um, everybody said I was crazy. Uh, I was in my 20s making over six figures a year. Um, and this is like 15 years ago. So six figures is double what it is, you know, with yeah, the coaches. like it was a lot of money, you know, for, yeah. a, for a 20 something year old that doesn't know shit, you know? Uh, so I was like, you're crazy. What are you doing? Quitting this job. You're never going to find a job like this. This is crazy. You're a VP. This company's big. I was like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> well, you're not, you're not, you're not a corporate kind of corporate kind of girl. I'm That's not. Like- I was like, I don't care if I'm a VP or this or th- I don't care. I'm I'm so bored. Like I hate reporting to a million people. It got to a point that every time I wanted to get something done, I had to consult like seven people and ask this guy and that guy. And, and I was like, this is getting so annoying. Before I used to be like, I want to test this on the checkout page on live. Let's see how it does. And I was like, oh, okay, good. Let's keep it on. So it started becoming super corporate. So I left traveled for a couple of months not knowing what the hell i was going to do came back was in debt of course like every great story uh <laughs> you start off being in debt and then i started direct pay net i sucked really hard for three years um really really hard like really did not know what i was doing i was like should i be a consultant should i be i think you know i think we have a little bit of a similar ish journey right i think when you start you're like i'll do this and then you're like no that's no good Uh, i'll do this no 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 that's no good oh until you kind of figure shit out you know uh so it it did take me three years and a lot of painful financial times uh but thankfully i was on my own that's the one thing that i always try to tell especially younger people before you like have kids and like this whole setup and like i feel like it's really good to kind of have the reason i was able to achieve success was really because I only had to take care of myself. So you know what? I can eat tuna and eggs forever and ever. Amen. I don't give a shit. I don't have anybody to feed. I don't have a mortgage. My car was a piece of junk. I didn't care. It was fine. It worked. I had a cracked windshield, drove it around for years with the cracked windshield. It was fine, you know? So I I, I, I really focused on everything. Work, 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 work. Uh, I had to do some part-time stuff on the side to get some money. Did that. Um went through so many iterations of my business before it it was what it is today, which is a high risk merchant account processor. Uh, it should have come naturally to me because I was doing that for Pornhub. But funny enough, I felt like I should go into low risk business when I started. Then I thought I should be in consulting. Then I should, I thought I should help somebody build a gateway. Then I thought I should, you know, maybe just shut up and get a job then i was like you know i just went through so and then and around 2014 uh which is a long time ago still but it was it's like about three years uh from there i said i'm going all in direct pay net high risk merchant accounts that's it that's all done and that's what i did and i was actually uh that's where i got a lot of success and uh and really you know mushroom from there that, that was a really long story but i hope no that's really i mean that's, that's the <laughs> ultimate entrepreneur journey i mean it's the grit it's the relentlessness it's the sacrifices you make it's it's everything that you do to get to where you are and it's like you know you we we go through those moments and like i even did that too where like i even tried to get in corporate runs and if you know me that was just a crap shoe they were just like who are you like get out of here and um and it's just it's you know you try everything you try everything you can because you know that you can make something work it's just figuring out what it is and oftentimes it's the things that are most simple to us that come the easiest to us and feel most natural to us that we are like, nah, nobody's going to want to pay for that. Or I'm not going to, you know, it's not going to work in that. 
but then you come back to it and it's like, oh, wow. And once you like really focus on that and you spend that energy putting that in there and you, you're clear on who your audience is and who you're targeting and who you help and how you help them, you can help with everything and like everything blows up. And that's the thing with you too, is you're not just bringing your clients the knowledge from the high risk merchant account and all of these pieces. It's, it's the knowledge of the customer service, the hiring, the HR, the, you know, the checkout optimization, the conversion optimization, sales pages, like your consulting expertise is what is another huge asset that you get to bring to your clients because you've had all that experience trying out a million things in every part of the business. Um, yeah. And I love that. I love that. I think it's super inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's 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 also, you know, on a, on a day to day basis, I get to see a whole bunch of people's pages, which I love, right? I'm looking at people's uh, sales pages, their VSLs, you know, their social, and I'm just seeing how things are, are kind of going through their funnel. So I'm like, I can tell obviously their conversions, right? Because I see their approved transactions, and their decline transactions, and then I see how much money they make and how they grow. So I'm like, Oh, wow, this is really good. So I, it actually gives me a lot of kind of a loop of feedback of like what's working, what's not working, how to do stuff. So that's why I, I I've been doing this for so long. And I still feel like I, I'm not bored. I, I can keep going for a long, long time. Oh, and it's fun. It's fun, yeah. too, because you like that, like optimizing the conversion side of things and like figuring out, I mean, finding finding the the, the lost money in, in things for people. And, that, and that's one of the things I did want to ask you about is like, you know, you kind of touched on this, but you're going through people's VSLs and sales pages and checkout and social and all these things. And you're looking at a holistic view of their entire funnel, not just this is the merchant processing, this is who you should work with. Like, what are, what are some of the things that you often find um, that help boost sales the most for your clients? Or, or how do you go about like optimizing their checkout pages and things like that? Oh, that's a big one. Okay, I'll get. I'll just get. I'll. I'll just say a few really easy, easy wins that I think a lot of people can implement. Um, I see a lot of marketers. They they really focus on front end, right? Like we get the client in. Um, I see very little effort on the upsells. A lot less than what's on the front end. So, you know, if you get a client that's in and he's ready to buy. You know, if you can sell them at least one extra thing and we have, we have a couple of, um, like, how, how do I say there's some people that go crazy with the upsells. And then there's some people who do nothing with the upsells. And I always see that there's those two extremes. So I would say the number one thing is take as much effort as you, you take on your front end funnel, do that for your upsell funnel. Trust me, it's going to work. You're going to make a lot more money. You're going to, you know, get more lifetime value off your client. And it's not going to be a, a lot of effort in terms of like cost of acquisition. It's going to cost you the same amount of money to sell them that customer one thing versus three things. So try to sell them more and your funnel should be optimized. Meaning it can't be like, I see this all the time. It's like they have this great funnel. Everything's great. Customer goes there checks out the upsell is like, Hey, do you want to add three more bottles? I'm like, come on, like, just no, I don't want to add three more bottles. Why would I want to add three more? like you're a marketer? Like, come on, write another sales page for that product, you know? So that's, that's one thing that I see that always lacks um, there. Also, another really big one is, you know, merchants and, and business owners don't understand that getting a decline transaction doesn't mean that that's a that's not a lost opportunity that's an opportunity for you to understand what's going on and i see a lot of direct response businesses have approval ratios that are abysmal i'm like oh my god like you have 100 transactions and only 70 are getting approved so you have a 70 you have 30 people that want to buy that did not buy from you why i don't know they just got declined yeah, but why? There's got to be a reason there. Like, what are what are some of the reasons that would happen? Because that's those are some huge numbers. Yes, I mean, I, I see. So, for example, one big thing is is merchants that are non U.S. So, let's say they're European and they're charging U.S. customers. Um, there's, you know, I don't know. How, obviously, we only have an hour, so I can't go super in depth. But if you're a foreign merchant charging, let's say, U.S. cards, your conversions are going to be five to ten percent less than with getting a U.S. merchant account. So you have to consider perhaps getting a merchant account locally in your in the U.S. if it's possible. If your volume's low, it's not going to happen. Like you need at least twenty five fifty k per month for a bank to consider a non resident account. But I'm going to say something very contrarian. This is where using Stripe and PayPal is your best friend. Mm. 
because okay. they have local merchant accounts and that you kind of borrow them. So if you're a European merchant getting your own merchant account to sell to Americans, like getting a, a an EU merchant account to sell in US dollars is not going to be great for your conversions. So there's that. Uh, another thing is, you know, for example, I saw a merchant, he's like, oh, you know, I'm getting so many declines, blah, blah, blah. Uh, like such a dumb thing. Like he didn't have Amex turned on on his gateway but he had it on his checkout page. So every time an Amex went through, it just didn't convert. I was like, well, click, problem solved. You know, it's just because I find a lot of business owners don't actually look at the gateway. They don't actually look at what, what the decline messages are. Sometimes there's processor timeouts, there's tech issues. Uh, there's, you know, uh, for example, insufficient funds. You're like, oh, well, what can I do if it's insufficient funds? Offer your customer an installment plan. He has no money. Maybe he doesn't have 300 bucks. Maybe he has four times $69. You know what I mean? So there, there's a lot of stuff that you can do not to lose that customer. And it, it, it boggles my mind sometimes when I'm like, well, why aren't you looking at this? This is a really, you know, you're paying for this traffic. You're getting it to your checkout page and then it doesn't convert. Oh my God, blasphemy. Like, why, why aren't you, why aren't you doing something about this? Oh, I didn't know I can, you know? So I like to open up a lot of uh, merchants eyes to that is like, you know, look at your decline messages, look at your data, what is your approval ratio, a lot of a lot of business owners don't even know what it is. And when they know they're like, Oh, my God, that's crap. That's really bad. That's so low. And I'm like, Yes. So that's a metric that you should always know is what is your approval ratio if it goes from 80 to 70? What the hell happened? Like, why are you why you're experiencing a decrease, right? So um, I guess I guess that that's the lesson there is know your data. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, and you're the numbers person. Uh, I know you said you didn't like the accounting and all that kind of stuff, and but like you are a numbers person. Like you are fantastic. I am, a, I am a math person. I've always <laughs> been a math person, even though I don't want to be. I am a math person. Yes, <laughs> you are. You are. But it's also the other thing about this is that you you're another pair of eyes to come in and look at these things. Where a lot of business owners, like most of the time, especially in the area that we're in, with DR and everything, they're more focused on the front end. It's not let's convert this better. Let's try a new headline let's try a new lead let's try this let's try that and they're trying to get more conversions on the front end but like you said like optimizing the upsells um taking a look at these declines offering these payment plans all of this makes a huge difference in in actually just making sure that you're i mean you're picking up hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of dollars depending on what your offer is just by looking at these little things yeah. and or having somebody else take a look at it if you don't have the time that's 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 when you hire somebody else to do it and all and when you do that's when that my extra money comes in from from them finding it so i i do i did notice like in there you kind of mentioned like for eu customers sometimes it can be good to go to stripe and paypal and i'm kind of curious like EU, USA, you know, what are what are some of the pros and cons of using Stripe and PayPal? Because I've had a lot of people get accounts frozen or shut down because of, you know, volume and things like that. So like, what are some, I guess, what are some of the pros and cons and ways that you avoid those kind of Stripe jails and stuff? Well, Stripe jail, that's, that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you're a startup, if you're starting your business, you're testing your business model or anything like that, you want to start with Stripe or PayPal. The reason is is because getting a merchant account involves an application, some documentation, uh, answering questions, and so forth. It's not that difficult. You know what I mean? Like people are like, "Oh my God, she wants six documents!" Like it'll take you a half an hour to get all the stuff that we need to get you a merchant account. It's not that hard, but it's not something that I think as a new business owner you need to be focused on. You know what I mean? Don't waste your time. For example, let's say you do everything to get a merchant account. You get your merchant account up and running and then you convert zero. I mean, you've wasted all this time getting a merchant account, getting your tech stack up and all this stuff for what? For nothing because you didn't convert. Stripe is very fast. You go, you sign up, you plug it in, you're good to go, move on. Uh, we have like a really easy API and plugins as well, but it's just, it's a little bit more work and I don't think it's necessary as your first step as a business owner. So right away, if you're starting on and you're just testing your business model, like, is this going to convert? Is this something people want? Is this, people are people buying this? What, how long are they staying in, in a subscription? Subscription, for example, or something like that. You want to take the first couple of months and figure all that stuff out. So you want to make things as easy as possible. And that's why you should go with Stripe or PayPal, because it is going to be a lot simpler. Now, you know, if you're doing under $25,000 a month, 
fairly low tickets, meaning under $250. Um, and you're doing, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month and things are kind of rolling and nothing's broken or whatever, I'd say just stick with Stripe. You know what I mean? It's not it, it just doesn't bring you anything to to go elsewhere. Now, mm -hmm. if you're scaling at like 25K or if you have high tickets, like over a thousand dollars is considered something scary for Stripe, like they don't like big tickets. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're doing anything over, let's say a thousand dollars a ticket, you have over 25 K a month, not necessarily that you would drop Stripe, but it's time to start thinking about getting a backup because Stripe is very temperamental. Okay. With Stripe, it's kind of like, I, and I get this at least three times a week. I, I'll tell you somebody like frantically calling or, cause when we get phone calls, like usually most people fill out contact forms and so on. But when we get a phone call, that's the desperate person. That is somebody that's like, I got to talk to somebody now, like, because their business is blown up. Right. So we get those phone calls and it's always somebody who's like, I don't have a backup. I don't have anything. They shut me down. They didn't give me notice. They Stripe doesn't give you notice. It's just like, you get an email. They're like tomorrow morning. Nothing's working. See you later. And then you you write to them and you get these endless AI bots that are answering all these random things and focusing on trying to get Stripe to fix your problem is not going to fix your problem. They're not, if they reopen your account, it's going to be a week or so, 10 days. You could literally lose your shirt in that time. So Dang. ideally, if you're listening to this and you're doing, you know, higher tickets, 25K or more, you want to get yourself a backup account, right? People have backup servers, backup customer service people, backup everything. It amazes me that the one thing that could literally close your business down, which is payments, you don't have a backup to. You have to have backup to everything in your business. So that that would probably be the first thing I would get a backup to because if you can't accept credit cards, then you are no longer in business. Simple yeah. as that, right? <laughs> And so, seven to days, seven to ten days, that's a huge stop, especially yeah. if you're like in the middle of the launch or something. That looks terrible. Who's gonna buy yeah. from you if like or repeat? Or you have an an ad campaign that's running that's converting like crazy now, people can't buy, and you're like, shit, I spent like all this money on a Facebook ad or you know, there's so many things like have a if 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 you're in the position right now that you, you're working with Stripe and things are going well, just get a backup. You know, you get the backup, you turn it on, you put you know, 10 to 15% of your volume, you never want to have an account that's just dormant because they get closed down. Like we close down dormant accounts. Like meaning if you've been with us for let's say three to six months and we've never seen a penny, a lot of times we'll just send a notice and say, Hey, you know, uh, we need to shut this down because it costs us money to maintain an account. So like, I can't keep spending money for an account that's never going to convert like on a business perspective for, for, for my business. So, um, and then, uh, you know, if you put 10, 15% or 20, depending on, you know, where you're at in your business and how, how it is, you just kind of put it there. And then if anything happens with Stripe, you literally flip a switch. You get to go. Yeah, you know, that's, that's it. That's, that's, I mean, it's, it makes it, it makes such a big difference. Cause like, I, I know people like, especially who have been, this happened when I first uh, got into the game too, when I was doing launch, it was, I think it was a launch we were doing somewhere between like 2012 and 2014 ish. And, and they were, you know, we had a couple backups specifically because Stripe and, um, was being really finicky about, you know, when you get a high volume all at once, which is what a lot of these bigger launches were doing, they'll shut you down. And then you're locked out like this for seven to 10 days. And then what are you going to do? But like you said, like having a dormant account also isn't super helpful because then if you switch over to that account and then all of a sudden you get a hundred thousand dollars coming in in a month that hasn't had anything in, then you're also in big trouble. So it's like, you understand the game very well. I get, I get clients like that often. They're like, it's been dormant for like three months and all of a sudden it's like, 30k day and then obviously we get a risk alert because risk is like well this account's been dormant for like three months how is he doing that oh send us a statement send us this send us that so like everything's a business banks like routine regularity and stuff like that so you want to always have a little bit of volume everywhere you know you can choose your main let's say stripes your main you put like 70 or 80 percent there and then you know you have your backup now you don't need necessarily many backups depends on your business, one will suffice, you know what I mean? Like, and then as you grow, you can add more. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think that like at the time when we were doing it, 
um, I was using Infusionsoft. And so Infusionsoft would uh, would automatically, it had a glitch. So it would switch back and forth on the payment okay. process unintentionally. But I'm pretty sure now services, you can do that where you can literally put it to say, this amount goes to this account and this amount goes to this other account. Yeah, for sure. Mo most shopping carts will, will have that feature for sure. So you can decide 10% here, 15% there and 20%, whatever, you know, however you want to split it up. That's pretty simple. Well, just having that backup and that support too, because the other thing is like a lot when this stuff is happening and you're in the middle of the launch or you're, you know, going through products and you're optimizing everything, even if it's just your standard day, but if you're doing 30 to hundred K a month and you're running ads for tens of thousands of dollars, and you don't really have time to go deal with this merchant and get that stuff being down and pulling all those documents for Stripe or any other merchant account. So it's like you're also there as like a backup for your clients to to help them through that because that's one of the most stressful times. It's like, crap, I can't accept anything and all this money is going out. Like, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. And I mean, you know, the, the I, I say this all the time to merchants and, and people who contact us, all the businesses and stuff. It's like you never want to hear from me. You wish you just talk to me, set it up and you never hear from me again. That's, that's, that's my, the beauty, I guess, of my business. People are like, you're, you're nice enough, but I hope I never have to hear about from you again. You know, it's just, they just want something to work and not have to set it and forget it. And as a, you know, being in the position that I was in before, it was the same thing for me. Like whenever I'd get a call from like a payment processor, I was like, Oh, what does he want? No, no, no. I don't want it. Like, just go away. No, no, no. Everything's good. Go, 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 bye, bye. You know? So, uh, you know, Ideally, you're working with a partner that doesn't bother you um, unless it's 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 necessary, you know, and they give you the warnings when when it's necessary as well. Yeah, a heads up so that they, you know, because Stripe's not watching everybody's account like that. Like they're not watching to tell you, hey, this is looking a little risky. Like maybe you should start doing this, that, and the other to to make sure that you're still kind of in good in good graces. So. And like I said, know your numbers, whoever you're working with, right? Know your chargeback numbers, know your refund numbers, just make sure you're on top of it. You know, I, 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 uh, obviously, you know, being the adult space and so forth, like we used to do weekly stats, like every week, where are we at in chargebacks? If I saw, for example, that, you know, I'm, I'm heading, I'm getting risky in one account, it was like, okay, well, maybe we need to shuffle things around. Maybe we need to figure it out. So you can't do that if you only look at your numbers at the end of the month, you know, it's too late. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And and that's another thing is that I, I know that you've helped, I've seen you help with a lot of clients is like avoiding those chargeback issues in the first place. Are you, is that like, you know, by setting up that process of reviewing them weekly or, or what are kind of some of the, the precautions that people can take to avoid chargebacks in the first place? I mean, sell what you're saying you're selling at the price you're saying you're, you're selling it. So that's number one, like be upfront with your customers yeah. uh, because some, you know, there are some shady business models out there. So number one, the shady business models are very, you know, 10 years ago, like customers charge back now. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't help if you're trying to mislead anybody into buying anything, um, you know pay a little bit of attention to prevention because chargebacks are expensive and they take, they, 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 they take. $25, $35, depending on what you're getting charged for it by your processor. So, you know, you could be losing a lot of money, right, from chargebacks and refunds and so forth. So, you know, try to prevent it by looking at everything in your cart and making sure that, you know, secret shoppers, like I have friends who I'll give like my credit card number to and I'll say, try to go buy this. And they record themselves on Zoom or, you know, they do a loom kind of thing, not Zoom, loom. They do a loom. And I watch how they're going through the cart. And I was like, oh, they're confused by this. Oh, they're confused by that. Why is she clicking here? What is that? You know, so because when you're in it, you're in it, you're like, click, 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 you know, and you're, you're, you're buying, but you don't know what your consumer does. So if you can get a couple of friends that are literally not related to your industry, not direct response people, not copywriters, just like a random, your neighbor, you know, Hey, can you go on this website and just buy and have them record themselves? You're going to learn so much about your product and service in your cart, you're going to be like, wow, I didn't know that people were getting confused about this and, and so forth. So that's a really good exercise to preventing chargebacks, because that means you'll fix a lot of things that are, are confusing people in your market. Um, and then, uh, you know, another thing that I always recommend is that we have chargeback alerts. So, you know, your processor, whoever you're working with, uh, or you can contact me and I can walk you through how to set up chargeback alerts. It's like a third party service. You plug it into your merchant account. 
before somebody charges back, you get an alert. You decide, do you want to contact this customer? Do you want to refund them and so forth? A lot of times it's an auto refund because at least you refund and you don't get an extra chargeback fee, like an extra $30, $40, whatever. So, you know, set up your, your chargeback alerts, um, especially if you're in, in a high risk arena, you don't want to have any problems. You rather deal with the alerts because a lot of merchants are like, oh, but like, I don't want to be spending money on the alerts. I'm like, well, you're either going to spend it on chargebacks and then have other problems, or you're going to spend them on the alerts. You might as well just spend it on the alerts and not have the chargeback problem, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that that those alerts really have saved a lot of, you know, pretty aggressive offers, I think, from going under. So so set that up as well. Um, and that's like just like kind of a nutshell of things. But I, I I do like to tell people to do the secret shopper thing. And and a lot of my merchants have tried and were like, wow, that's that gave me a lot of information. I'm like, OK. Or what I do, what I used to do a lot is uh, I'd get on the on the phone and take a couple of customer service calls. Those are always fun. Always, you know, you you get on the phone as a customer service agent you know, for your own company and you hear exactly what customers are telling you. And then you do that one day a month for like an hour, treasure trove of information. Oh my God, I bet. And new products and everything else that you can do to serve them. Like you're really getting to know them. And I just, I love that secret shopper idea. That is so brilliant. Cause I mean, I know there's hot jar and stuff like that, but it's not the same as when you're watching people go yep. through it as marketers. We go through these pages day in and day out. I mean, I'm just clicking, I'm reading, I'm skimming. I know what to look for on a page, but, but yeah, like our, our friends, our family, like neighbors, like people, people who aren't in this day to day. That's, that's freaking smart. I like that. I like that a lot. It's, it's, it, hot jar is great. You know, obviously you want to have heat maps and stuff like that, but it's, it's like you said, something else to watch on a video, what somebody's doing. You're like, fuck, I didn't realize that doesn't make any sense. You know, it, it, it brings up a lot of ideas. Oh, absolutely. And if you can get them to like talk out like what their thoughts are while they're reading it, you can change like the language in your copy. You can change like the way that they're like, like the way that you're speaking to them, where you need to like add stuff. Like that's, yeah. I mean, that's, I like that a lot. That's such a cool idea. And of course, like getting on with customer service, like you learn, and you learn a lot about them, but I think you also learn a lot about the impact you're making. That's what I notice is like when you, a lot of people forget to like look at what the customer service responses are or, you know, the feedback that you're getting, whether they're positive or negative, you can either turn it into a positive by creating new products and ways to help that person uh, and connecting with them deeper, or you're going to get positives and learning about the impact and how you are helping people and how you can kind of really double down on what's working. For sure. So I think that's cool. It that's always cool. comes back to customer service. <laughs> it does. I mean, we're in the customer service industry, especially like, you know, especially in the consumer world and everything else that we are. It's just, it is, it's crazy. And I know we're running close on time. So I have a couple more questions. I'm not going to go. So oh. I'm going to go crazy with you, but I do want to ask you like, you know, you've hit on this a little bit, but like, what's a time that you, that something like really drastic has happened with a client and like, how did you solve it? Cause I've heard you, I've heard clients come up and just like gush about how you saved them from like seven figure jail time or, or losing like massive amounts of money and being shut down. And, and it's just, you know, I'm curious, like what, what is like a really drastic event that happened and how did you help them with that? I mean, as much as you can tell us. Yes, obviously, I, I cannot reveal the secrets, especially of the people that I work with. But um, I mean, I've one pretty big one is uh, a merchant uh, that I, I knew that had a couple of accounts with me, but not for the product in question, um, was with Stripe doing a nice seven figure a month in volume. I had warned him not to work with Stripe for this particular product because I was like, this is not going to be good. It's not going to be good. He was like, no, no, it's fine. It's working well. Every it's it's integrated. A lot of people like easy, right? And I get it. You know, Stripe sometimes is super easy if you're working, let's say, with Shopify and you just plug in Stripe and all that. It's super fast and easy. Uh, he was doing seven figures, you know, a couple of million dollars a month in sales. Um, and he got that dreaded your account has been suspended email. And, you know, you're doing two, $3 million a month in sales. Your ads are dialed in. Your affiliates are mailing for you. Like, what the fuck, you know, like, what, like what? Ha, uh. So that's was a phone call. Of course I got a phone call uh, and I was like, uh, you know, take getting a merchant account takes about a week if all goes well. Right. So it's like, okay, well, 
you got a week. Uh, what he's like, I don't, I don't have a week. I have an hour. Get me up and running in an hour. Like I can't, I have affiliates mailing for me. I have, you know, promos going on. Like I, I, I just like, it, this is going to destroy me. It's going to, it's going to take us like months to recover from this. That's what it, you know, the issue was it's going to take months to recover from this. Cause if affiliates switch their offers, if I turn off ads, if I, it's just too disruptive. So, uh, we kind of came up with a ma master plan, which was, um, get a PayPal account, turn it on. They're going to shut you down. We know they're going to shut you down. But yeah. it'll be enough time for us to just swoop in and so forth. So, you know, using a strategy of getting another kind of third party account, there's a few. There's not just PayPal, there's Adian. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna go and just give like if you need names, reach out to me. But there's quite a few that you can kind of set up really quickly. They don't check your account. So you're live and up and running in in like an hour, right? You're just you're good to go. Uh, like Stripe, for example, Stripe, PayPal, Adian, all these guys, you're, you're, you're up and running very quickly. Um, and then it takes them a few days to kind of notice what's going on with your account. But if you're kind of in the, in the process of getting your merchant account, you go really, really, really quick. You get all the documents and so forth. You could, it could buy you the time. So that's what we did. Uh, thankfully he didn't have to turn off his ads, didn't have to turn off any, everything. PayPal did catch up with him, like literally the day before he was going live with his, his merchant account. So just continue. They'll hold the money. They'll release it in 30 days. So a lot of times what they do is they hold money. So I'm like, it doesn't matter. You just need to keep going. You need to be processing. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to get some credit out because they're going to keep the money 30, 60 days. By that time, we'll switch over to the merchant account and in 30 days, you'll get your money back from PayPal. And we kind of had all these moving parts all together and we 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 figured it out. He's good now. <laughs> oh my God. That's some out of the box thinking. Like talk about like an emergency band-aid tourniquet needed in that moment and the way that you were able to kind of like solve that for them. I think that's huge. Like just because when you, especially like for a business owner in that mental space in that moment, I highly doubt they would have come up with something anywhere near as genius. They would have just like, I mean, I don't know what they would do. They just sit there and freak out, I guess. So like to have, have your support and like to come up with that plan of like, you know, yeah, it's going to shut you down at some point, but this is a band aid. It's going to get you through to the next step so we can get you that merchant account and get you the actual setup that you should have been listening to me about the whole time. <laughs> Exactly. You don't want to, you don't want to do the, I, I told you so, but you know, yes, I told you so. <laughs> uh, just like, you know, a couple months later, be like, Hey, remember what? No, I'm kidding. No, <laughs> better to just let them recognize that in the end. For right? sure. I, I, I do feel like, you know, when somebody saves your business and so forth and helps you, you know, I, I, I do have very good clients. I'm very happy with, with, you know, I think I, you know, you attract and there's energy out there and you you attract the people that you want to work with eventually um and i, I think i've very, been very lucky i don't really dislike any of, of the the larger merchants that i work with at least I, I i i ended up becoming friends with some most of my clients i've been to weddings of theirs i've been to like baptisms and all kinds of family events so uh very, very blessed to be working with a lot of like really cool people you really are. You really are. And because you are a really cool person yourself. Like oh, every you. time you get on the phone, like Maria just spits amazing knowledge and she's just, you're so kind and caring. Like I'm grateful to call you a friend for sure. And I know that like many people in the industry are as well as it. And it's just nice to, to, to find a community and friends of people that you can connect with like this online. And, you know, you're their savior in many ways, but also to get to be like an actual, actual friend to them. So, I mean, You've got all this, you've got all the merchandise stuff doing, you you know, you're, you're the go to for people for a million things. You also are big into metaverse, you're big into like, you know, you do marketing strategy, you do so many things. You have an adorable son and husband and a, a wonderful life at home too. And you know, you're close with your family and your parents and your sister. How this is how how do you kind of juggle it all like how do you how do you feel like you're you're holding those pieces together wow uh i mean i i do my best it's not it's not always good um i i feel like there's always a time for for different parts of your life so like there was a time where it was business 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 and that was like when i was first starting and i was like very tunnel vision didn't really have time for anything else um, and then obviously when I had my son, that that's, uh, becoming a parent, uh, 
it, you become really good at time management or you become better at time management because I, I realized I was not good at time management because I just worked whenever I had to work because I had nothing else to do, right? Like I just worked. And then when I didn't work, I didn't work. And then when I had to work, I worked again, you know? Uh, so when you become a parent, it's like that little thing that you've created that that's going to tell you who's boss. Like, okay, wake up now. I was like, ah, you know, I don't, I don't like waking up. I don't like waking up early. I hate waking up early. I am not, I'm a night owl. I'm a night owl. So I, I just, I find strategies to, to help. So, um, you know, I've been lucky enough that thankfully I had a, a really good start in my career before I started the family and all that. So that's good. Um, and again, if, you know, people who are younger, I always recommend that because it's, it's so I, I'm, I'm in family mode now. Um, and I do find that like, I've slowed down because I've had to, like, I have things, I have parent teacher meeting, for example, tonight I have, you know, I have to take him to like karate and, and stuff. And, you know, you just, you got more to do. So you can't, you know, you can't focus. And, uh, also, you know, a kid needs your time as well, right. And to play with him and stuff. And I enjoy it. I, I like just playing with him like we he comes home from school and we just sit down and we're like let's play like he makes like his new things like he likes to make a jail and then like we're teenage mutant ninja turtles and we're like trying to get into the jail to get the bad guys out anyway like you just play like random stuff that just m makes your mind not even think about anything but um i mean long answer to your question but basically you just have to focus on uh, one thing and realize that the other thing may suffer in consequence in the meantime. So right now, it's a little bit more family for me. Um, now my son started kindergarten this year. So like the first month was like a little bit stressful and stuff like that. But now things are getting back into a routine and I can really focus on my work again and kind of work on new projects and so forth. Um, and, and don't feel bad about, you know, not having enough time, let's say, to do the work that you were doing last year. Somebody, somebody, I can't remember who told me this. I, if, if you're listening, or if you're here and you told me this, I will give you credit because I don't remember who told me this, but it was really good. Uh, it was somebody in direct response, but I just can't remember who. It, it's like you have different jars. Every jar represents one area of your life and they can't all be full at the same time one's going to be overflowing so if it's family that's overflowing that needs more of your attention and then the sand in the work jar goes down and you know it's it just all it has to be moving and um i hear a lot of people about like the hustle culture you know hustle 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 and i am i like the hustle culture for a certain period of your time of, of your life i was a big hustler in my youth like hu like hustler capital h like if I saw a dollar sign somewhere, I was after it. I was like, I'm going to go here. I'm going to do that. And, you know, but it, as you get older, it changes. Your priorities change. You want to live different lives. You, you know, you want to try to enjoy life differently. But like, if you're like 21 years old, yeah, fucking work 15 hours a day. Who cares? You know what I mean? Like I, I did it and I don't regret it. I can't do it now, but it was really, it was fun. It brought me a lot of opportunities. So hustle when you have to hustle and then take your, your, your foot off the pedal when it's time, you know? I love that. I love that. I think that's so powerful. It's like we have different seasons of our lives and, and, and different abilities. And the thing is like, you're not slacking in your business. You still are killing it. You take care of your clients. You take care of everything that needs to happen. You go above and beyond. You also do the podcast. You do a million things and you're still getting all of it taken care of while getting that time with your son, which is so incredibly important. So I know that you lean on your team a lot to help you in those moments as well. And, you know, you obviously have a great team at home with your husband and, and getting to play with your son. I mean, Ninja Turtles, man, that's my jam. I love that those are still around. <laughs> well, I, I made him be like a little bit of a, you know, like, you know, he watches all the cartoons I used to watch when I was a kid because I'm like, at least I enjoy it. I don't want to watch those cheesy cartoons that are out there now. So we watch Ninja Turtles and G.I. Joe and... He's he's a boy, so I can't watch Gem and the Holograms, but that was one of my favorite as well. Uh, I'm, I'm aging myself now, but yeah, I, I watch things that he goes to school, I'm sure. And people are like other kids in his class probably don't know, you know, like the, the, the cartoons that he's watching. Like he, he likes playing G.I. Joe and G.I. Joe is a very like late 80s thing. My husband liked G.I. Joe. And I'm like, I told my husband, I'm like, we, we need to get him to watch more like popular culture stuff because he's going to go to school and nobody's going to know what he's talking about when he talks about these things he'll, he'll be a, a wise soul a wise older soul that's, yeah, that's maybe <laughs> yeah it's good to be different right 
Exactly. Absolutely. He's bringing some flair to his friends. I love that. I love that. And it's nice because, uh, you know, having a kid, you're getting to relive all those fun things from childhood. For too. sure. Yeah, I do love that. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, this is this has been really awesome. I really appreciate you sharing with us today. Like this is this has been super helpful for me. I've definitely learned a lot. Um, I would like to know if there's, you know, one thing that you could tell a business owner to look at in their startup stage and then in their, you know, mid to, to 15, 20 plus stage, what, what do you think would be like, I mean, those are two different areas, I guess, but what would you tell them? What's, what's one thing you could tell a business owner? Mm, my, my favorite is know your numbers. I think uh, I'm going to stick to that theme. It's, it's like people don't know their data. They don't know what is happening in their business. So you can't improve on something if you don't know where you're at. Like what's your baseline? How 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 is it going to get better, right? Like if you know what your approval ratio is, you can make it better. If you don't know what it is, then how are you going to make it better? So know your numbers at every stage. Yep. I love that. That's perfect. If it's all the stages and then it's exactly, it is, it is crucial. It is crucial. So this has been really freaking awesome, Maria. I really appreciate you having this conversation with me today and joining us here in Streamline to Scale. This is, this has been really fun. Yeah, it was really fun. Thank you so much for all the awesome questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I hope, I hope they were, I hope they were okay, but I got to learn a lot. This is just my, my way of getting to, to, you know, really interview my friends more about and learn more. <laughs> as I uh, dive into different areas. So thank yeah, you. That's, that's exactly why I started my podcast. I'm like, I just want to pick people's brains. <laughs> that's <laughs> an easy way to do it is interviewing them. There you go. <laughs> that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And if, if anybody here is listening, definitely check out Maria's podcast, direct response marketing. It is phenomenal. She's got all kinds of amazing guests on there. I think she's got like Chris Haddad and Alan Sultanich. I think you recently, who is the recent one I was just watching Oh my gosh. Um, there's so many amazing ones. What are so many? I mean, I, just, I, I mean, I've had, I've had the, I guess the who's who of direct response on there. So, you know, uh, Alan, Alan was on it. Uh, Chris Haddad was on it twice. Um, I had, um, uh, Amber Spears was on my podcast, uh, mm -hmm. Pauline Longden, Laura Catella, um, mm -hmm. all like these very powerful females on there giving us some great advice. Uh, I had, uh, oh my gosh, in terms of males, I had so many, uh, Julian, um, Julian Reyes, Andrew Contreras was on there. Um, just like some really powerful, uh, Rich Sheffrin was on my podcast twice, <laughs> Uh, so I, I can't even remember, but yeah, I have some really, really good interviews with some really, like I had Michelle Lambert on there. <laughs> Thank you. you. Know. Thank yeah, you. no, but you know, Michelle, like, I, I don't know much about ops and like you, uh, it's important. I think for people to understand, it's like, I know one thing, but I don't know other things. So I was like, well, I want somebody to teach me about ops and you've taught me so much about ops and SOPs and all. I hate that stuff. Like, <laughs> so, I mean, like I hate it, meaning I know it's a necessary part of my business. I just don't like doing it. So I'm happy there's people like you around that are that like doing it, right? So it, it works out. So uh, yeah, I mean, we'll definitely promote your episode again so people can listen to it. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. I appreciate it. And, and the way you feel about ops is the way I feel about knowing my numbers. So I'm glad there are people like you around who forced me to actually face the facts that you have to look at these things. And you do. You really do. Because I've been growing my team recently and that's that's a big thing. So I really appreciate you. Everybody definitely check out Maria's podcast as well as Direct Paint It is if you're looking for some merchant processing and advice. She is top notch, phenomenal, the woman to talk to. So thanks so much for being here, Maria. I really appreciate it. And I'll uh, drop the links in the below. Perfect. <laughs> thanks, Michelle. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you.